Hello explorers and welcome to another video. Today we are going to talk about disaster recovery and how to actually handle when you have OSDs that are full. And in this specific case I had a client that had used the Ceph system and ended up with one or a couple of OSDs that became full. They couldn't really start them anymore because they database file could not be written to because the hardware was full and you might be required to do something like this if you have like hardware uh, that is uh, SSDs that might become not writable anymore they are only readable because they have ran out of writes that could be something as well that could be a problem here but in this case, it was too full. We needed to do something about it. We needed to migrate the data over to a different device and be able to run the system from there in order to start OSD and get up to sync so we could retrieve the data because the data was not accessible because of some of the OSDs could even, couldn't even be started. And a good point here is that the system was not a production system. There were no traffic running through it. It was just something that was uh, used to save a lot of data in the, in the cloud and do a lot of backups. But in this case, the data was not available. So what we started off with was adding a new drive to the system and then copying over all the data. And the easiest way to do that, if we jump over here, uh, we can look at LSBLK, so the list all the block devices. And here you can see that I have a 10 gigabit disk that is uh, not full. I just added some things to it. So if we mount CephFS here and look in CephFS, you can see that I have two versions of the OpenJDK here. So I have some data. Uh, we can touch a file here, for instance, uh, uh, I was here, so we have some new file here. So now we see that we have a new file in this system. Let's unmount it again. Uh, but that is my CephFS uh, installation and it's running on this disk. But it, if I say that this 10 gigabytes is too small, I need more space. So I've added this disk that is 20 gigabytes instead. And in order to get all the data over to that one, uh, I use this dd command. So I run dd with the input uh, file being the block device of the first device. And then output file is the block device of the other one. So I write byte for byte the stream that is on the disk. So all the metadata, everything that is there. And I have chosen to have a stream amount of 100 megabytes because the drives can handle it. So it goes a bit faster than just writing byte for byte. So you use a little bit of memory in order to write and read. And I also want to start this progress so I see what's happening. And then if I run this, it takes a couple of minutes in order to copy over all the data. So I'll get back to you when this is done. So now all the data is copied over, but I need to shut down the system, remove the old drive because the metadata will not be read in and the metadata for both drives in this LVM system is the same, which might be a bit confusing for the system. So if we look here, we see that we have some metadata for the SB, uh, SDB, but we have no for the SDC even though we have copied it over. So if we restart the system, it will show up there, but I don't want the old drive to be there to be confusing. So I will shut this down and remove the old drive and then start it up again. So now we have restarted the system. I have removed the other drive. I see that I, if I mount it here and look at it, we have all the data still. If we do an LSBLK, we see that we have the new drive here. It's still SMB, SDB, but it's 10, 20 gigabytes. And we see that we have 10 gigabytes within this one, which is a little bit strange that we don't have the right amount of data here. If we look over here, we can also see that it's 10 gigabytes available at the moment and we have a little bit of an issue to read the drive. 
But other than that, everything seems to be up and running. But we need to fix this so we actually have more space. So let's unmount our CFFS to start with. And also let's uh, stop the actual OSD. So system control stop Ceph uh, OSD at zero. So now we should not have that OSD started. The status should be inactive there and this should be reflected in the GUI later on here. So now we have done that. Now we need to do the resizing. So if we look at this um, PV display, so this is for the actual group, the physical volume and the physical volume is 10 gigabytes still in the LVM records. So let's do a resize of that. So PV resize on this one. If we run the display again, we can see that we now have less than 20 gigabytes, but we have at least updated it so it could recognize 20 gigabytes of space. If we look at the uh, logical volume instead, we can see here that we have less than 10 gigabytes here. So we need to update that as well. So we do a logical volume resize, add an extra 10 gigabytes and then take this LVM path up here, copy that in and run. So now we're updated log logical volume and we should display 20 gigabytes now. Why didn't it do that? Not found. Did I? Oh, I didn't copy the full. So I need the full URL, of course, the full path. So now I updated that. So we have 20 gigabytes in the logical volume as well. So the problem now, if we look at LSBLK here, is that we also have an encrypted volume here. So that is a problem, of course, that if we now only had the logical volume, then we would be done here. We will need to update the metadata for our blue store. But now we have an encrypted volume as well, so you need to handle that. And in the configuration directory, the temporary directory for Ceph on this OSD, if we go into OSD, Ceph OSD 0, we can see here that we have a bunch of different files. First off, it actually uh, says where you can find the block device. You can also have links here to block wall and block DB, so the database and the write ahead log could be in different spaces, but now we only have one block device. Um, we have the FSA ID and so on, and we have the key ring that we are talking to the actual monitors with and so on. But there is a lockbox key ring as well. And usually this directory, when you haven't started the OSD before, it's empty except for this lockbox key ring. So all the other data here will be populated when we have the uh, connected with this lockbox. And this lockbox actually gives us all the information required to unlock this device. So this local device that we have here is locked and you need this lockbox key ring in order to decrypt it. And this is a decrypt uh, thing that we need to unlock. So if we look at this lockbox key ring here, we see that we have uh, this ID here. And we also, I have already copied this, I believe. So let's see, uh, client OSD. So I already copied these, this lockbox over to etc Ceph, and then the name of this lockbox key ring. Um, so this, client name here and the reason I did that is because this command that we want to run now in order to get the actual keying material it doesn't really support any way to give this specific key ring to the command so it will look in a couple of different places for this key and one of them is in our self configuration directory under the same name as the uh, client here. So the client name dot key ring should be in your config directory in order for this to work. Then we can run this command. So I will copy this client ID here over to my document. I will copy in this command. So we run Ceph cluster Ceph name. So the cluster name is Ceph. The name of this uh, 
specific key is that client. And then we want to run config uh, key and then get. So we want to get the specific key and we want to get the dmcrypt slash osd and then we want to use this uh, name over here. So the, the last part of this lockbox name is the actual ID for this lockbox. So that ID plus lux, which is the method that we are using to encrypt. So this will give us the lux key and that is the data for that. But I will copy that over to TMP uh, DM crypt key. You can call it whatever you want, but that is what I have called it. So now I have that in this temp file. Then I can run crypt setup resize. And then I use the name of this encrypted volume up here. So Y7 and so on. And then I put in the key file for this DM crypt. So I want to De decrypt this encrypted volume, resizes with this key and get a new size for it. And if I run that, it takes a little while and, and then I run lsblk, I will have a 20 gigabytes encrypted volume instead. So now we have the right size of the volume. Now the only thing is the data itself and if we now uh, try to start our OSD again, we will see that the, we have a little bit of a problem. So let's start this and go over to my GUI here again and see when it updates. Uh, perhaps I need to reload it. Yeah, so now you see here that I have 20 gigabytes available or 20 gigabytes in it, but only nine gigabytes are available. 10 of them is not there. It's just, a problematic thing that we have added 10 gigabytes but all of it has been used already and that's not good so if we switch over here again and then run the command to check the b device sizes so ceph blue store tool blue fs b devices sizes and then the path to the specific osd then uh, we get an error because I haven't stopped the OSD, so it can't read it. So let's stop that and then run the tooling again. And then it will give us that this device has been using 10 gigabytes already. A little bit more than 10 gigabytes, but at least 10 gigabytes. So the metadata here is wrong. So we need to expand this disk. And then we can run the same thing, but we change sizes to expand. So Ceph Blue Store Tool, Blue FS B Device Expand, and then the path. If we run that, it will update this device size up here. And then, so it does the expanding, and then we get an error here. And I can't really explain why they have implemented this uh, in this way. And it might be something that is solved in later versions of Ceph. But if we look at the specific code here, uh, first off, up here, we are running through and expanding the specific wall. And then it runs through here and checks the ID. And if the ID is the same as BS lay low, uh, layout shared BDEV key, it will not do anything. And it only looks at the wall and uh, DB device. And in this case, none of those are the one that we have here. We have the block device. So if we look at this blue FS here, we have B dev walls, DB slow and so on. Um, but we have a full block device instead. So we have this DB, but it's uh, the same as this share B there. So this for loop is actually not doing any anything. It jumps over that and then types out, we want to expand things here. Uh, and then it gets the device path and then uh, checks through that. No, they, we are down here. Uh, so down here, it's actually checking if the, size, the new size is larger and it is. So it will go in here. It will do this expansion here, write out the new metadata, which is good. 
And then it will check if the supported BDAV label, and that will be true. And then it will try to set the label size. And here is where it fails, because up here when it runs uh, this, it will run it on P, which in turn is this get device path. Uh, and then it will get back this device path slash block, which means that it will find the block device and be able to update something. But down here we run it on the path, which is a directory, so it can't really set the label on that directory, because it's not the block device. So perhaps this is a bug and something that I need to update, but the only thing that we wanted to write down now is the metadata size, and that seems to be the only thing that is required. Because if we go back here and look at the sizes again, we can see that we are now using 373 megabytes instead. And if we are starting our OSD again and look into this uh, here and then update and see when it actually happens, we will see that the raw capacity changes. So we actually have 19.6 gigabytes available. And we go over here, so we actually just have warnings instead. So every every PhD uh, PJ is there. The only warning is that we only have one copy of them, and that's fine. Uh, if we go over here and now mount our Ceph file system, we should be able to see all the files there as we did before, and the, also the file that I added last. So this was what I wanted to cover today. I hope that you found this interesting. It was a little bit strange, uh, some of the errors that I got, and uh, there was a lot of different steps, so it can be hard to follow, but please re re watch it again if you need to. And if you have any questions or suggestions, leave them down in the comment section down below. If you like this video, give it a like, share it with your friends and colleagues. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that, and I really hope to see you in the next video.